Hey everyone, my name is Josh Williams, as Todd said, um, and I'm the lead pastor here at the Elm City Vineyard. I am thankful for you all uh, being here. It's good to see people, good to see some new people here. Um, all that stuff is very encouraging. One of the things that uh, I want to ask you guys as we start is um, who here has worked on uh, a home project before, whether it's like a renovation project, whether it's like when you were a kid or older, but you've worked on, okay, we got, we got some hands. Oh, we got a lot of hands. Good. And how many of you did you finish exactly on time? Like when you said you were, oh, okay, we got a thumbs down. No. Building projects apparently take some time. Even as I parent my four and two-year-old, when they try to build some things, not only do they need a lot of help, but things actually do take a lot longer. Uh, it turns out the messes can be fast, like you know, water everywhere, dirt everywhere, those are fast. But like building, it's like, well, daddy, can I do, well, daddy, I need that, and daddy, it just takes a lot longer for us to build. Building projects are hard. Um, Maybe you've heard of something called like a church building campaign if you're like a church kid, like, and you can start when you're five, and maybe you graduate high school, you leave your, where, what happened to that building campaign? We're in the same church building, so like, where did that money, just don't ask too many questions about that. If we ever have a building campaign, we'll, it'll be very clear. We'll have a lot of processes, it will be okay. But some churches, you know, just, it's a little, it's a little crazy. Um, sometimes this happens in cities. If you remember uh, any community meeting you went to, probably starting around three years ago, and then uh, rewind like 15 years, any meeting you were at, a budget meeting, a meeting about violence, a meeting about schools, you would always have like someone, usually like a kind of a grandma, get up, and when then they get up, you're like, oh shoot, they just get up, they go to the mic, and they say, do y'all remember the Q house? And then people are like, oh my gosh, and they're like, when it was the Q House times, there was peace on our streets, there was things to do, kids didn't do these, like, and the Q House was like this magical place, right? And this is what the Q House looked like a while ago, and it looked like that probably for, Hannah, would you say like 15, 20 years? It's, it was a long time. And then finally, I'm not gonna say it was any campaign thing or promise, I'm not gonna go into politics in this, local politics especially. Um, but hey, look, now we have this beautiful Q house with maybe, there we go. Yes, this is, yeah, isn't that amazing? So if you go on Dixwell, like this is what you'll find. It's like really great. They always like, you know, isn't that like, some people don't know this. It's funny, they always were like, look at like the African markers on the side. We're like, we get it, like, it's like, but they're like, it's, it's the African markers, the tribal markers on the side. They're very proud of that and they should be, it's amazing. But there's something about going from this long held dream to actually getting it done. But that takes some time. In this case, it still is take, taking time. I think LEAP is there, a youth organization, but you probably cannot go into the building unless you are a kid. Um, so for a lot of you, you cannot go. But hopefully you will someday. Building projects take time. Some get finished, some don't, and some are in a perpetual state of limbo. Like you just don't know what's happening. Probably like the church that you might have been from as a kid. We were like, is the building fun still? I, I just don't know. I'm not sure. And just because we have an idea of how to build something, it doesn't mean it gets done. This is a big ouch for me. Just because you have an idea of how to build something, it doesn't mean it gets done. If you guys ever experienced this in other ways where you like think you text someone, but then you look back and you're like, I just didn't though, right? Like sometimes we think we did something and we didn't. Turns out that happens a lot with buildings and building projects and this idea that we can construct things with our life. Oh, I thought, I just didn't. Whether we're building an actual construction, whether it's a project or campaign or community, whether we're building our own life to more fully embody living like Jesus, it's easy for this work to get delayed, and indeed it's easy for this work to just not be done at all. We have to ask the question, are we building by ourselves or are we building with God? Are we building by ourselves? Or are we building with God? Scripture speaks about this very plainly in the Psalms. Psalm 127, 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. Unless the Lord's the one in charge of your building project, 
a co-laborer with you on your building project, speaking to you about it, saying he loves you all the way through, celebrating your victories, mourning with you your failures. I'm not sure if that building project will get done. And we have a pretty important question to ask at the front of this time. How do we know the Lord is building the house? Unfortunately, it's not just as easy as putting a Jesus fish sticker on one of the beams, physical or metaphorical. It's not as simple as simply praying for success. Jesus, won't you do it this semester for me? I need the grades. Come on, Jesus. It's not as simple as shouting out, won't he do it at the end when he did something and claiming victory in Jesus' name. Knowing the Lord builds with us is an act of discernment that begins with a call from the Lord and matures with demonstrated fruit for God's kingdom, God's rule and reign in the world. We know God is with us because we see signs of his promise even in the dark. We see signs of God's promise even in the dark when things are cloudy or hazy because why? We walk by faith, not by sight. This admonition and encouragement from Paul to the letter to the Corinthians, it's the second one, and that chapter starts with this verse, for we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. It turns out that sometimes the things that we're building, we can't measure them even by looking as good as the Q house did with all its markers and not. We can't do that because sometimes the things that God asks us to build, they end up destroyed. They end up hurt or maimed, empty, and it's still to the glory of God because we're with God in the building. So we don't have to depend on the product looking like a success, but rather us being fruitful in our obedience unto God. That's a challenging word for us. And I think what I'm going to say is going to make that even more challenging, looking at stories from Scripture and challenging us with situations from our own lives. Because when we build, what do we want to see? We want to see something shiny. We want to see something bright. We want to see something done. What if God's not as invested in that as he is in our obedience and in our relationship and work with him? This is the work we've been talking about in this series of walking backwards into the future, turning our back towards anxious thinking, false futures that we can become preoccupied with, and instead turning our back to those things to say, God, would you speak to me out of the ancient story that you have? What does it look like to build things with you in the past? What are the ways that you might have called me out of a certain way of being? I try to build alone. I've seen that in my past. The last two things I did, but you're calling me to build together. We can actually turn our back on these anxious futures, to see what's happened in the past, in the story of God, and in the story of our lives. And then while walking backwards, we can hear a voice from the future, a voice that we don't see but hear, that speaks to us about the future that is to come, who God is as a healer, who God is as a provider, what the kingdom will look like in full, and also God's still small voice calling us forward, giving us faith, giving us direction. This is the way of the Lord. This is what we're talking about today. Two weeks ago, we talked about going from a place of paralysis to movement, this simple call to have faith to go, to just go. One week ago, we talked about starting small and taking the pressure off for us to have something that seems like a big victory or a big win. We're just looking for a small uh, step of faithfulness. And this week, we'll talk about having faith to build. It's more than movement. It's more than appreciating small beginnings. This step is constructing upon a foundation and learning out, leaning out to build something that we hope will last some way, somehow. Maybe not because it's going to keep all its glean and shine, but because there's eternal work in being faithful over the long haul and saying a small yes that becomes a deeper yes, that becomes a mature yes, even costly, even to our very lives but it can build something beautiful. Before we continue, I want to think about what's at stake here. What's at stake in this message? And you're hearing of it, and you're listening to these words and the words of Scripture, and then trying to be obedient or wrestling with, who is God in the midst of this? What's at stake? As we've been delving into this series, Pursuing Faith to Go and Faith to Start Small, we've seen that they've changed history. Abram, Abraham, his story about faith to go means that there was a way that faith moved forward, quite literally, in his own path, him blessing all the nations through simply saying, I, I can't stay here anymore. God's called me to go, 
and he did. We saw in Gideon's own journey last week how this battle, he had too many people. He, he wanted too much security, and God said, I want you to trust me even with less. So you see that I'm with you, that I'm for you even in less. And we've kind of alongside that looked at this journey um, the first week of MLK and how his yes wasn't this like yes that was from uh, uh, tons of stuff he knew how to do or from maturity of being, you know, 65 and an elder in the movement. He was a 26-year-old man. And he basically stepped forward that just looked like staying still as other people moved backwards. <laughs> and he was the only person left. That was his small yes. And yet it did so much work. And we talked last week about how this movement was empowered not just by these towering figures that we now know them as, but there were people that empowered these voices that were foot soldiers of the movement. Usually women, men and women together, different ages, oftentimes older folks, they just say, I'm going to give my yes through walking today. And those foot soldiers made up the core of the movement. That's what's at stake here, our, our real world stories. Faith to go, faith to start small. And yet, at the end of the day, our faith usually does mature with building. That saying, repeated yeses that have depth with commitment, with the trajectory, our small yes becomes bigger. We see this even in that same story of MLK, where what happened in Montgomery started happening all across the South, then it spread to the North, and then it changed our nation and even our world. Yes, there was a call to go. Yes, there was a call to start small, but then there was real fruitfulness as people remained obedient. And I believe that was a work of the Lord. That's how I see it. God is up to a lot as we think about what would it mean for us to build and even to rebuild. Today I want to just share two simple stories from the Bible. Uh, one that's about obedience. Uh, building when we hear a call to obedience. And one that's about building when we hear a call to desire. And then I just want to share a simple story. One that's personal to me. Um, and then we'll uh, give a call at the end of the talk for those that feel led to build and to rebuild. That call will just be simply a call to stand and then to receive prayer. That's what we'll be up to today. But before we go any further, I just want to pray, knowing that we want God's presence to be with us. We want to check in and experience God and to know, God, you're, you're right here. Holy Spirit, thank you that you are calling us forward as a community Thank you that you are with us, Jesus, and that you're guiding us. Would you come and have your way today? Come and have your way and be present to us, Lord. We need you. We depend on you. We can't do what we want to do without your presence. So would you come and have your way? In Jesus' name, amen. So we'll start by talking about faith to build in obedience. As I think about what it means to build out of obedience, a story when I was preparing this series a while ago came to mind that was really striking. And whether you know this through Hollywood, through Sunday school, through the Bible, or somewhere in between, you probably know the story of Noah. Um, this is a verse we'll read in a second, but uh, the story of Noah is, you know, of like Sunday school fame probably. Um, but there's something about the story where when you just drop the needle in the scripture, we see that people in this land, uh, in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, people were evil in action, violent, killing one another. And it says in scripture, evil in thought, that their every inclination was to do harm. Just a few chapters before, we see this good account of life, a good account of creation uh, in this perfect garden. And then so quickly, it seems, things devolved, at least as we read the narrative. There's even a heartbreaking part of the scripture that says, God looked at humanity, the humanity that he had created, and he said, this wicked creation, why would I even keep them around? All they know is violence. This is so different than what I intended. Maybe I should just start over. But God doesn't choose that path. He sees Noah this man of righteousness, and says, I will make a path, I will make a way for this man and his family. And he asks Noah to do something very specific. I'm going to pick that up in the book of Hebrews, which is a book of um, people who have had great faith. Actually, everyone we've talked about so far is in that book or referenced somehow. And here's what it says. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about things that had never happened before. 
By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world, and he received the righteousness that comes from faith. The part of this scripture I want to focus on a lot, and the part that I really love, is this part, he, uh, he obeyed God who warned him about things that had never happened before. Noah was this man who apparently heard from God somehow. I don't know if anyone watched the Noah movie. Please, if I talk about this for like 30 more seconds, stop me. Just be like, stop, Josh. I like the movie. There's some good parts. <laughs> they are really cool about God speaking to Noah. They're like really creative and interesting. They're like sp- God speaking to him through images. That's all I'll say. It's worth like a watch at least for like the first 30 minutes. Um, <laughs> talk to me later if you watch more. But God speaks to Noah somehow and says this word of build an ark. And there's a question here of what does Noah know? Does Noah know what a big flood is like? Does Noah know what a big ark is? Does Noah know what a powerful storm is that would make him even think that building something like that would be necessary? There's some people that go even further to be like, did it even rain before? You know, in Noah's time. We're not going to get into that either. There's an interesting song about it that I can show you sometime if you want to. But (laughs) some people know that song. That's why you're laughing. If you're not laughing, it's okay. You're not missing out on much. But... There's a sense of Noah being called into something that he's never experienced before. This is not an ark. I don't even know if it looks like an ark. But imagine building something, not this small, but much bigger, right? And building it as people come by and say, why are you building that thing? And Noah has to say, because God told me to. And they're like, what, what, what do you think is going to happen? We don't even live by water, Noah. Like, this wouldn't be fun for you. Like, I wouldn't want to go on the boat with you. And Noah's like, I have to obey God. And then it rains a little bit, and people say, you know what? Then it storms a little bit more, and then it starts to flood. And all of a sudden, what Noah has been building by obedience starts to make sense. But there was a lot of time where what? It didn't make sense to Noah, to other people. There was a sense that God warned him about things that had never happened before. And out of that, there was a call to obedience, Obedience to save his family, obedience to follow God's deep desire to bless all humanity, even in this way that we might be deeply confused by. That's okay, we can bring our confusions and questions to God. But this is the way that God challenged Noah to obey. And there's some ways that it's almost like, that's amazing. Like, it's great that we get this clear way of relating to God through obedience. Sometimes we wonder, like, how do we hear from God or how would we build? This is a way that I think is merciful when God speaks to us directly. And we know that's what God is probably saying to us. I think about a story in the life of the church. It's around an issue that we'll be talking about a little bit later. uh, Where in 2015, I had just become lead pastor. Uh, That happened in such a strange time where uh, if you know anything about what's happening in 2014 and 2015 in our nation, there were a lot of police shootings, a lot of uh, deep unrest. And in 2015, Freddie Bray was killed in Baltimore. And then I got an email That was from a woman named Liz Moore, who's a church planter now um, in Princeton. She was with our community. And the email was a dream. And the dream said, hey, I saw you, Josh, and you were leading a a team to go to Baltimore. There was, uh, and then she said people's names that you may or may not know. But I saw in in the names, oh, this person's an artist. This person's a scholar. This person is uh, kind of into justice. It was almost like a microcosm of our community at ECV. And I remember thinking, I don't know what this dream is about. I guess it maybe is a call to prayer, but let me just send it to the elders of the church to say, I actually looked up like how far Baltimore is and it's like very close. I should have known that, but I didn't. (laughs) And I was like, we could like drive there in a way that I didn't think to drive to Ferguson. And that didn't feel like maybe what God was calling our church to do at that moment. But I was like, can you guys just help me out here? Because in my like self in who I am, like I want to go, I'd want to drive to Ferguson. But I, I realized I wanted to steward what it meant to be obedient to not just do what I wanted to do, but to ask these people that could hold me and could lead and guide and help shepherd, do you think this means to go? And as they prayed and kind of had a sense of a witness, they're like, yeah, we think it is. We actually think this is maybe literal, like you should ask these people. And you could, you know, broaden that. And the trip was an amazing trip to go to Baltimore together to be what we kind of called prayer chaplains of this kind of movement, to just wear, you know, a little tag that said prayer minister and to pray with people. And we did that on uh, our way down. We, we met people. We did kind of a service project. We went uh, exactly to the place where there was the most uh, kind of um, protest and unrest. We got covered by news. I don't think we've ever seen that real, but Tina like led us in song, and people joined us that weren't part of our group. And then we prayed for people before being hosted by a vineyard pastor right outside Baltimore to debrief the experience. It was like a deep experience of 
seeing God speak to us and us saying, I think we should take this seriously, not to say, well, that's just a dream. And it was strange. It was the, the last night of the curfew, actually. If you remember that time, there was this curfew that had such uh, conflict because one city, basically, even though the whole city was in, under the curfew, one side of it, and you can guess which one, basically wasn't being enforced at all. And on another side, it was being enforced quite strictly. And when we went, it was the last night. And it, it felt strange in the timing and what God did, and it just seemed like God was moving in our community. And we got to respond not just based on um, our passions, or our ambitions, or our ego, our hope to be like a justice church, but out of what seemed like God's real speech to us through this dream and through discerning that God might be in this in a different way. This kind of building can be hard because we can feel so convicted. It can be so clear what to do that we can almost even like get paralyzed or psych ourselves out. For me, I was like, this couldn't mean this, right? And then I emailed it to the elders, like, I think it just means that. <laughs> like, I think it's that, that's what it is. But for me, as a black man that cares about justice that would want to do it, I, I had this kind of second guessing. And it was so great to process that in community and to see what God was up to. It's so freeing that our building is not only coming from our ego, our ambition, or in response to our fears, but also because the Lord's speaking more directly through the Bible, through his still small voice, through prophecy, friends, dreams. And I don't think this has to be like as intense as this like example that I, I chose, but it could be just when you're feeling convicted to start a Bible study and you feel like God says, like, start a Bible study with these, this group of people. It could be when you start a Sabbath practice because you read scripture about it or you heard a sermon and you feel like this is something that I need to do. Maybe it's ending a pattern of sin that God calls you away from. He's spoken clearly in scripture, clearly in your life. And God's just saying, will you be obedient to build a kind of life to build this kind of community. And all you have to do is say yes, because God's spoken that to you. He's called you to this work through his speech and his word. So as you think about that, there's a question for you, is where is God calling you to build out of obedience? Where has he spoken to you, asking something of you, speaking to you what to do, inviting you further in, in a way that the question really isn't if God has spoken, but more what will you do about it? Sometimes we pray that God is that clear, but when God is that clear, we shudder. Because we're like, dang it, I can't really get lost in that. Well, what has God said? And we ask our friends, and they say, I think he just said that. Like, now my friends know about this. Shoot, like, what do I do? Do I have to switch churches? Like, what, what's going on? Like, I need to hide behind this. But it's just clear. Like, that's the call to build a kind of life, to build a sort of community, to build maybe even in a project that God's calling you to. This is what God is up to. This kind of building is building on a, a firm foundation. We see that in the scripture. Jesus said there's two kinds of houses, a house of sand and a house where you can build on the rock. This is building on the rock, which is the word of God. This solid commitment that we can discern in community. And that kind of building lasts forever. But there's another way to build too, and this is tricky, but I, I hope that you'll see me and follow me here because there's not just that way of building because otherwise I think maybe we would have done it already. We would have heard already. God would have given us enough commands, but there's something else I think God really presses into because God's not just someone that's giving us obedience commands, but he's our father. He's our friend. Parts of scripture even say he's our lover. We also build out of desire. And this is tricky because dire, desire isn't necessarily based on what we've heard from God, but what we feel is God shapes and forms our heart. It's easy for us to be like, no, no, my heart's the sand, Josh. Like the, the rock is the word, right? The rock can never be my desires. But there's a challenge in Scripture that our desires actually change. Our heart changes as we spend more time with God. And in that, our desires are a place for our building work to be done as well. And that can frighten us. And maybe it should but we can do that work with the Lord. One of my favorite stories is in the book of Nehemiah. It just shows this in such a clear way, and it's a whole book, and you can read it on your own. We'll just get into one chapter, drop in. But there's something about what happens when we respond to desires. And I'll read uh, this. It basically talks about how there's a, a king of the land and when wine was brought for him, this is now Nehemiah speaking because it's in first person, I took the wine and gave it to the king. 
I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruin and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. We talked about building out of obedience, but this is a work of rebuilding. I wonder sometimes if our desires are often going to be rebuilding. They're places of longing that we have. And God is interested in our desires. Did you know that? God's interested in our heart and in our sharing of it. The king of the land here isn't God, but the king's interested in why Nehemiah is sad. Did you catch that? And out of that inquiry, it's desire from Nehemiah that surfaces. Nehemiah just doesn't say, hey, this is what I desire, but his face is long. His face has a story on it already. And the king inquires about the story that's on his face. Can I say something scary to you? What if there was someone in your life that saw your face and read you? And it it wouldn't be you saying your feelings, but they said, hey, I think this is what's going on. That's the kind of desire that God has for us. That Actually, when we make a face, when we feel something in our heart, and some of us have pretty expressive faces, by the way, even with the mask, I can still tell, um, sort of. Uh, But there's a way that God's interested in what's happening in our heart. It's only out of that inquiry of, Nehemiah, why are you sad that his desire surfaces? I think that's deep. Do you think it's possible to build in faith from just spending a little bit of time, maybe even right now, thinking, why are you sad? Nehemiah actually found some traction there. Why are you sad? It's January. (laughs) It's cold. When you leave, it will be dark. Sorry if this is, you know, bad. But sometimes that is a superficial reason why we're sad. That's real to us in a lot of days, right? But there's even a lingering thing that it brings up. Oh, no, there's another reason why I'm sad. Could it be the case that God wants to inquire about that, to see, well, what are you willing to build out of desire with God? Nehemiah looks inward and sees his desire. And what is it? It's a a rebuilt Jerusalem. And he says this amazing phrase, if it pleases the king. And here it's, if it pleases the king, help me rebuild Jerusalem. And by the way, this rebuilding work is physical. It involved going back to Jerusalem. It involved looking at gates and land and walls. And as Nehemiah did that physical place-based work, he ran into opponents, real people that said, why are you doing this? People actually lived there. They said, we don't need this. What are you up to here? And he expressed faith that God was in this project, not necessarily because what? He had heard directly from God, but because he saw a flow of something. Well, I was sad. A king asked why I was sad. I said that I had desired to rebuild Jerusalem. And I said, if it pleases the king, can I do this? And there was permission. There was a flow of God's movement, even if it wasn't as direct as maybe the speech that Noah received. That's important for us. Because sometimes we're waiting for something to be clear but your sad heart is clear enough. Your enthusiasm to build something is clear enough. Your sense that you're with God and a passion or in a flow is clear enough. Nehemiah looks inward. He sees desire. He, begin, he brings it to God and to the king, and the land is restored. That's the result of the story. The, the, the gates actually are rebuilt. The walls are rebuilt. Like there's something that wasn't before because of Nehemiah's desires. And it's fair to point out that this didn't happen perfectly. If you know the story of Noah and the story of Nehemiah, you know both these stories didn't happen perfectly. They both commit missteps that come from not checking in with God, not being in tune with changed desires, influencing the work of building. Sometimes we get so excited about the project that we lose sight of the relationship, the one who started the the project in the first place. But thankfully, both of these men still had their projects come to pass, but ultimately they needed to have faith in God, including faith for God's work to take place in their heart in our hearts around them. It wasn't always about the physical thing they were building, but it was about the work internally that was happening in their heart and in the hearts of their community. This is the crucial reality for having the faith to build. 
We submit our building to God along the way. We check in with God. We say, God, I think it might be going well, but can you speak into this? God, it's not going well at all, and I could move on human effort to make it happen, but I feel like that's not the way anymore. I feel like that'd be out of that fitful anxiety. So can you speak to me because I'm stuck? Remember, building often takes longer than we think it does, but we can still check in with God to see what God is up to. We submit to God because our relationship with God is always more important than whatever we think the project is or will be. Even if God started that out of obedience or desire, we always check in with God because our relationship with God is more important than whatever project it is that we feel like we're stewarding. It's easy to get distracted by a godly project. That might be a weird phrase for me to say, but it's easy to get distracted by a godly project. I know it's right. I know it's good. I'm going to do it. But we still have to check in with how God wants to lead us. Last week I showed this pattern. I'm not going to explain it fully, but it's this pattern of uh, specifically things we see in Hebrew scripture um, where it starts off with sin. That sin leads to corporate oppression. There's some repentance, deliverance. There might even be a time of peace, but it kind of goes back into the cycle. One of the biggest reasons why is because it's hard for us to continually check in with God because oftentimes we just want to keep checking out. We built it, God. That was hard. I'm done now. It's successful enough. Someone else is stewarding it. I need to be done with this. God, this tension of continuing to check in to see how you're doing, how I'm doing, it's just too much for me. I'm getting another kind of offer to feel better through doing something else, through checking out, through tuning out, through getting a desire met. And we miss the boat again and start the cycle over. But God has a different way. If it's of the Lord, God will release it back to us when we check in. If it's malformed, God will correct it and us. If we're good, God will encourage and bless us. We don't lose when we stop and check in. We don't lose when we go slower. We don't lose when we submit our plans and our work and our building to the Lord that is our creator, our maker, our father, and our friend. It makes us anxious when we check in to think, what is this God going to say? How have I done it? Did I do it wrong? Am I okay? But this God is our father and our friend, and he loves us. And he's actually going to love us if we completely fail the project. So how much more will he help us if we check in? But oftentimes we don't believe that. As important as the walls and gates of Jerusalem are to Nehemiah, God is more interested in protecting, in protecting us with his fiery love from the potential idolatry of his projects. There's this, this really interesting line in the story of Nehemiah, or actually in, in the story of prophecy about Jerusalem, because it actually says, Jerusalem's a city without walls. It'll be protected by the fire of God. I don't think that means Nehemiah's like completely off, but it means that he's focusing right on something where God's like, that's good, I see your heart in it, but actually like, my fire's enough. How many times have we been focused on this, the thing that we really feel is like the most important thing? God's like, you're close, keep going, but speak to me so I can help you out. We might get a clue of a potential godly habit here in the narrative of Nehemiah. He asks is, if it pleases the king so many times. You read this thing, if it pleases the king, if it pleases the king, if it pleases the king. It might we need to keep using that phrase, but maybe change who we speak that phrase to. If it pleases the king, but not the king of the land, not the king of Babylon, of a foreign country, but the king Jesus that we serve. Why would we do that? What's at stake? Well, even Jesus did that. Because as Patrick was speaking about, the night that Jesus died, the night he was crucified, he went to his father and said, if there's any way this can pass, if there's any way this can change, let this cup pass from me. He checks in, and God says, no, this is your cup. It's your path. But remember, the thing we're building doesn't always have to look gleaming or shiny or bright. Sometimes the biggest things that we could build for God are things that are going to get destroyed. They're going to be lost. They're going to be hurt. And in that will be the glory of God for us and others. Jesus' broken body and shed blood for us. 
Are we ready to feel the faith to build out of obedience or desire? And then crucially, are we ready to check in after for further steps of faithfulness to avoid disobedience or tripping up or malformed desire so we can build for the long haul? What happens when our godly project might get in the way of what God wants and perhaps is already doing? I think this is deep stuff, but it's what happens when we serve an alive God who doesn't need us at all, but is willing and desirous and desperately wants to use us as an act of friendship, as an act of love, as an act of redemption in this human partnership that's gone so afoul before, but now can be so beautiful. We need to have the faith to build and to rebuild, to continue checking in with this God who is the master builder. We're stuck in these tensions, right, of God being like uh, the potter and us being the clay, where it's like, okay, that's about obedience, right? (laughs) But also God being our friend, which kind of has this check-in relationship. Both are true. It's faith, trust, real relating to God that let us, us live in this relationship for it to actually be a relationship. God's calling us to be faithful here, not just in moving, going, not just in, pro- and not just in starting small, but actually building projects, sometimes building communities or just building our lives. It can get incredibly tough. One last story, then I'm going to uh, explain our call and do some invitations. Um, I realized something and I'm realizing something more as I get older, which is there are real things God's asking us to build that are really important, and it's costly when we don't. And we can feel it, we can see it together corporately. We know when God's calling us to, to build something, and then something happens, and we just see the leaking, that, that something wasn't built. And we see that something is needed. And more and more as I get older, I see that the church has a unique role, like a central role to play as a, a community that would build something that would help this greater whole that we're in. If you remember in May of 2020, when George Floyd was murdered, there was a sense uh, from so many corners of what will we do? How will we respond? How will things get better? And I remember just kind of looking around and I didn't see really anyone that was building something that was gonna hold the kind of heartbreak that you could see, the tragedy that we felt. Like I looked at, you know, Mayor Elliker, I looked at, you know, I looked at all these places, right? I I didn't see someone that had built something that could hold. And even at ECV, what I felt we could do, and I felt it was faithful, and it was we could basically do a prophetic funeral. Like 50 days later, what will happen? Kind of a, a, a witness, like, will anything change? But even for us, we were simply lamenting, simply uh, grieving, which again, I think that we had grace to do that. But I wondered, what, what's going to happen here uh, in the Vineyard USA, the organization that our church is a part of, and that I was kind of involved in some leadership stuff. I was like, can, is there something we can do? And at every turn, we were just flat-footed. Like, we didn't have something built. We didn't know what to do. And I think that's maybe what a lot of us felt. I think that's why there was this corporate cry, stuck in our homes, isolated, like, can anything change? And so many people wanted to do something, and I think we ended up marching, which isn't bad. But I think we felt like the feet on the pavement would change something, would build something, would grow something. And I think that's why what ECV did was kind of revelatory to say, 50 days later, I'm not sure if it will. And however many months and years later, I don't think it has. And the question is, what are you willing to build? Like you in your seat right now, what are you willing to build? What is our church willing to build to anticipate the things we think God might be doing in the world? to speak to the desires we actually have in our heart? What happens when God wants to communicate us through our desires, but it might start with our weeping and our sadness? Will we accept an invitation to build there or only when we can see glory? What happens when the shock of the moment surprises us or catches us off guard? When the Lord's maybe been speaking through our desires about black men and women being gunned down as if it was sport, about this past year's 20 plus homicides that were unsolved, leaving our city not only more unsafe, but where human life begins to actually just lose value because people don't care, even who took life. How can you even do restorative justice if you don't know what happened? We can think that's hyperbole, but about a changing world that's groaning and speaking to us in heat, storms, cold, and quakes. What if we cannot hear a call to obey? Perhaps God spoken to us that long time ago, but we can't hear it anymore. But we do have this deep sadness, but are we letting the king, King Jesus, ask us, why are you sad? 
And can there be a call of desire that comes from that? Are we open to that again, or do we feel like we're going to get played? Because things are too hard. Systems are too broken. But I think there's something I'm trying to tell you very sincerely. I don't think anyone's coming to rescue us. I don't think there's anyone here to help besides King Jesus. We've had a few goes of these different things. Probably pick your justice issue. Probably pick your own issue in your life. You've probably had a few rounds to think, is anyone else coming? And I don't know who is, guys. I think his name is Jesus. And he's coming more than just giving you a right relationship internally so you can feel good on a daily basis as things crumble around you. But so there's something that you have as an inheritance, a call that he's actually giving you to build something to make this life beautiful, even if we get crushed in the process. I have a conviction that there's something that God's asking us to build as a church, that there's something God's asking you to build individually that will make this life more beautiful, more whole, more just. And I've tried thinking that there's another way. I've tried thinking it could be our effort or something else, and maybe I'm naive and maybe there is something coming. But when I look at what we're up against, I don't see it. But I know Jesus can call us to go. I know he can start small, and I know he's calling some of you, I think actually all of you, to build something. But we need to be honest that God has a call for us. Perhaps it's through something you felt already in this call, this talk is reminding you of it. Perhaps it's something that is sadness that's welling up inside of you and you feel like there's desire there. Perhaps it's like something you've just heard clearly from the scripture out of obedience. But this is the work. I want to just explain a few invitations that are for all of us as we continue to reflect on this talk and what God's doing here. And then I want to call us, uh, whether we feel like we're called to build or to rebuild, I want us to mark that by standing together and waiting on the Lord to see what God does. I think that the hope of the world is what Jesus is doing in the local church. I think the hope of the world is calls of obedience that you all have in your hearts, desires you have that you're going to bring to God. There's a few invitations. We continue to ask for the gift of faith. If we think we're faithless, if we don't have enough, God's calling us to receive the gift of faith. It's a spiritual gift that we can ask for. We can ask, where does a call to obey God look like a call to build for you? And is there hesitation in you? Ask God to call you forward. I think it's important to ask that question, where are you sad? And is there a desire there that's actually a call that's emerging? And where have you let godly desire be felt but not acted upon? Is God calling you to build in that desire? What do you need from the king to move forward? Noah had to hear and obey. Nehemiah had to be honest about why he was sad and let that desire lead to a response. I want to rebuild Jerusalem. If it pleases the king, would you give me resources to do so? We have to respond, work with God, to act in cooperation. We have to have faith, trust, to build with God. So I want to ask you now uh, to reflect. Because I think uh, God's spirit is here. I think God's spirit is on certain people to respond to this. To reflect with whether there's a call that God's given you to build that you're aware of right now. To build out of obedience, something you've heard from Scripture, heard from the church, heard a still small voice. And also something that's a desire that you believe actually has the beginnings of a godly desire. If you're feeling that desire for a faith to build or to rebuild, I want you to stand now in response to what God is doing in your heart. You can just pop to your feet to say that this is something that you are called to by the Lord. We all are going to support one another here, and there's something that God's doing in all of us, but for folks that feel that conviction, there's a particular grace I think God wants to uh, pour out. I can invite the worship team to come up. I think there's a particular grace God wants to pour out on you 
because this world needs what God's putting inside of you. And we need one another to help check in with us about what God is doing. I'm going to call Todd to come up to see if he has anything else um, as a word. But I just want to pray right now and recognize what God's doing. If you wouldn't mind if you're standing up to open your hands as if you're receiving a gift. And if you're near them and are comfortable praying for them or you have a word for them, you can actually start praying for them right now. But Holy Spirit, I pray right now for those that are uh, standing up, uh, for us to be their community. So give us the gift, God, of community and the gift of the work of the church here. And for the ones that are feeling a call to build, God, whether standing or not, would you give them right now the gift of faith? God, would you give them the gift of compassion? I feel like you're releasing compassion on them because it's the desire to serve others for for most of you that's calling you to stand, to have an impact on the lives of others. There's something about imagination of stepping in to something that you can't see yet, but God wants to imagine that with you. And I pray, God, there's actually real resources that the Lord gives right now, like real tangible resources of community, of friendship. God, I pray for openness. Openness for their obedience, not to necessarily look like that headline story that everything is going well, but a deeper obedience to feel like the Lord is in it and with you. Um, I had, I felt like, and some of you were maybe considering, like Josh asked the question, is God calling you some, you know, to build? And the phrase that maybe came into your head was something like, probably not. Right? That's not from the Lord. It's something like, probably not. Like, here's the thing I've thought about, but like, I'm rather inclined to think that the answer to this is probably no, because X, Y, Z, right? I feel like there's an invitation um, to kind of enter in with the Lord to that, what, what feels <laughs> what feels probable to you about the not? What is it that seems like, you know what, that probably wouldn't be the case um, because X, Y, and Z, and to really just kind of... Um, Yeah, own those doubts and let the Lord kind of speak to you in that place, whether it is a question of of resources or, um, yeah, friendship or support or a thing that feels like, actually, this thing is broken and won't hold the thing that the Lord would pour in, or this thing, like, I have tried to do and it actually, like, isn't, hasn't been, probably won't work, Um, that there's an invitation to, to actually be as honest as you might be with the Lord in that place rather than kind of turning aside to be like, ah, oh, probably not. That's probably not for now. Um, but to say, why, why does it feel probable <laughs> that that's not for now? Yeah, the other thing, I, I saw an image of like two trees. Um, this is a, actually a picture that a friend of mine took many years ago. One that has all its leaves and is green, and the other one doesn't. It's not necessarily dead, but it's not uh, flourishing. It's not producing fruit. Um, and I felt like for some folks this call to build becomes immediately comparative. Like, oh shoot, like I'm the tree, I'm the tree without leaves, and now I'm being called to like, look at like another tree (laughs) that has built a thing that has made a thing. Um, And again, I think there's an invitation um, to enter in (laughs) with the Lord to that place of saying, you know what, I have felt like I've not been fruitful. And when I think of my lack of fruitfulness, I actually am thinking of it in light of another place of fruitfulness. Like, you know who did a really cool thing? That person. You know who, like, has obvious gifts? That person. I'm not that person. I'm the other tree. Um, I think the Lord <laughs> the Lord would speak a no <laughs> to that kind of place of identifying as, as, as not uh, having the capacity to bear fruit, um, but also to just enter really into that place of saying... Uh, yeah, where, where you've decided you're the sort that, that doesn't do that or, or even has some, some kind of envy or some kind of funkiness in the comparative, the Lord would want to meet you in a way that kind of erodes that comparative and actually speaks a fresh thing to you about who you are. I'm going to pray for the Holy Spirit to fall on us and to move in us in a deeper way. 
It's going to begin our time of response. Um, you know, it's funny because the beginning of this time uh, before when I was playing this series, I was like, we'll just have everyone come to the front at the beginning, at the end of these calls. And then, uh, you know, COVID got a little bit more serious. So we're not going to do that. But I, I do feel like those who are standing, there's a call for you to, to keep receiving prayer. And so if you're next to them or if you are a prayer minister and you feel called to go to some people, please do. If not, and that doesn't happen to you, I'd love for people to go to the side because people will pray for you. It might take us some time, but we will pray for you. I feel like there's something the Spirit's doing here. So as we transition to worship, I want to pray for the Holy Spirit. Um, some of you guys have been at ECV and you've experienced us doing this, but the Holy Spirit's here right now. We can actually pray for the Holy Spirit to keep highlighting and recognizing things that God is doing. So I'm going to just move into that mode of saying, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit and move amongst us right now. Whether we're sitting or standing, there's something you're doing as a next step for us. And I pray your presence would come. We need your power because there's uh, things we're up against, Lord. There's a real power that's against the work of your kingdom, against the work of life. And you want, uh, you, you are doing kingdom work. And we need your power to access that. So Holy Spirit, I pray right now for power from on high for these ones, for a real protection, God, for these ones, for something to, uh, to be different, God. And I pray if there's a heaviness that comes on, that they would just receive that heaviness right now in the name of Jesus, that heaviness of glory, of goodness, of weight, of the Spirit. So come, Holy Spirit, and have your way. Have your way in us. So God, I pray right now that you would continue your work as we sing together, as we respond corporately to what you're up to and what you're doing. I pray, God, as people have stood or feel like there's something that's the next step, I pray they would go to the side and receive more prayer to get specific words of obedience, to call out that desire. If you're a prayer minister, you can start moving your way to the side now. I just pray, Lord, that there would be new steps from today. New kingdom steps, God. Pray in openness, God, to your kingdom breaking through, for us to build in response to your great love for us, not of pressure or performance, but in response to your great love for us and the need we have in our world for that great love to find and be in every single corner. So we pray that in Jesus' name. I'm going to turn it over to the worship team at this time. Again, if you're standing and want, want prayer, want us to speak into some things that are happening, please make your way to the side and we can pray for you. Even if it takes us a little bit of time, we'd still love to pray. Otherwise, we'll continue worshiping here together. You'd stand.